he came out the gates with his first theatrical feature, becoming a beloved classic. This is 1978's Grease. He go on to do The Blue Lagoon, White Fang, Honey, I Blew Up the Kid, and one of my favorite films, The Flight of the Navigator. This is just to name a few. He's an author behind books such as the Nina Fosh Course for Filmmakers and Actors, He co uh, which was co-author with George Lucas. Uh, he did Grease, the director's notebook, and his recently released Drawn Directors, Volume 1, a collection of stories and contour drawings about iconic directors that we all know and love is available now. A uh, Philly-born Yankee, like myself, graciously taking time away to talk to me on his birthday, Randall Kleiser, Thank you so much for being a part of the show and happy birthday, sir. Well, thanks for inviting me. I look forward to it. Well, you have uh, quite the career and time is not on our side. So we're going to jump straight into it without any of the pleasantries. Uh, starting with 1978's Greece, is it true that John Travolta recommended you to direct Greece after working with you on uh, The Boy in the Plastic Bubble? We had a really good relationship on Born in the Plastic Bubble, and that was the first time John was the lead in a project. You know, he had done uh, Welcome Back, Cotter. He was a big star on Hot Welcome Back, Cotter, but he was playing a second banana or a third or fifth banana, but he, he was the leading guy on that show that everyone loved. So when we were casting Boy in the Plastic Bubble, he was the perfect guy to do it, first time being a lead leading man, and so... Since we got along well, and then he was hired to a, a three-contract deal at Paramount by Robert Stigwood, he um, requested me as a director. And the first job uh, I was supposed to do was, was Saturday Night Fever. Oh, and wow. I, I was flown to New York by Stigwood to meet Nick Cohn, the guy who wrote the article in New York Magazine called Tribal Rights of the Saturday Night. And then I didn't hear anything for weeks, and then suddenly they offered me grease. So... I guess they decided I was better suited for Greece, which I'm happy about. Yeah, it seemed to work out. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, and I'm going to reference, uh, we'll, we'll get into drawing directors um, on its own thing, but I, I am going to reference it a little bit throughout here because, of course, there's plenty of stories in there that draw back to connections that you had with filmmakers or actors, or there, there's connections to be made to the project that you had in drawing directors. Um, and one of them is uh, Quentin Tarantino. Uh, in, in his chapter in your book, you talk about how um, uh, he, he played like a, a big part in rejuvenating John Travolta's career. And I was wondering, like, as somebody like yourself who's seen John Travolta from the beginning, the early stages of his, of his career, and then in the 90s, you kind of saw it take a dip and to be rejuvenated like that. Did you feel any any kind of personal feelings as somebody that's worked with him on that level? I was absolutely thrilled that John had, had such a big hit with um, Pulp Fiction. And um, when he was dancing with Uma Thurman, you know, I, I kind of had a little flashback feeling. And that was cool to see how Quentin um, referenced those type of moments, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I... I just, you know, from the outsiders, fans watch what happens on uh, with the stars that we grow up loving and they kind of fall out of the spotlight. And it's always cool when uh, and Quentin Tarantino is great for this, not just with John Travolta, but so many stars where he takes these people that have that pop culture has seemed to have forgotten. And they, he just, you know, gives them a injection into their career that, that boosts them back up again. That's really awesome. Right. You know, Greece. Uh, along with your first student film, are both in the Library of Congress's National Film Registry as being culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant. Um, and I feel like as filmmakers, especially as filmmakers, we're all after that some degree of immortality where you know, we feel like our legacy is going to outlive us in what we do. And um, I remember the first time that I got something on Amazon Prime, which is a far cry from, you know, the Library of Congress. But I remember just sleeping a little bit better at night, knowing that there might be a handful of people out there that are stumbling upon my work without me handing it to them personally. And that just made me feel good. And I can only imagine how that feels for you. And I'm curious, you know, how because everybody's different. Everybody's egos are different. Um, how you take that, that your work is essentially guaranteed to live on well i'll tell you it's the student film that really uh, knocked me out because i don't think there are that many student films in the uh, national library of congress i the only uh, i don't know how many there are but but uh, to have my master's thesis be there that that was the one that really made meant a lot to me because that was about my grandmother it was a personal movie called peach 
It's available on Amazon. You can see it there. But it's a very emotional story about our family and my grandmother in a nursing home on Christmas. And so to have that go there was really the one that uh, that I want. <laughs> oh, yeah, that, that's even double because, I mean, the works that we make that are fiction, uh, just because our name is on it, we feel like that's us living on beyond our time. But for yeah, your first story to actually be about something so personal, that has got to make it even better yep. for sure. So we're going on from Greece into 1980 with the Blue Lagoon. And uh, again, in your book, to uh, this, you kind of go into uh, in your James Cameron chapter, um, I, something that I thought was incredible, uh, almost better than the Library of Congress. To receive a compliment from the seemingly impossible to impress James Cameron is one thing, but for that compliment to be about a scene involving water, and we all know how he feels about the particulars of shooting water. Um, that's even more incredible. And and also to find out that your sequence from the Blue Lagoon had a part in inspiring an aesthetic, the aesthetic of Avatar uh, when they're in the water. How, how, do, how does that, like, how do, how do you feel? I, I mean, uh, to me, James Cameron is like a god, but you have been around before James Cameron, but there's no denying, you know, his relevance in the industry, especially in the areas he's complimenting you on. So how does that feel? Well, I'm a huge fan of, of James, and uh, I absolutely love all his movies, and um, like I do all the people in my book, uh, drawing directors. But uh, that particular one, I had when I saw Titanic, and I saw the breaking apart of the big ship, and th it was just done so well. And I, I told James that I said, well, "Man, I just was blown away by that sequence in your film where the where the." Titanic breaks in two. He says, well, I really liked your sequence in Blue Lagoon where you had the kids swimming through phosphorescent water and, and the, 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 the water was lighting up as they swam. And my brother actually did that using the old technique of optical printing where he step printed all the, all the, 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 the swimming scenes and then uh, had them blurred and something. Anyhow, it's something you wouldn't do today, but it was something James liked. And then he later used that phosphorescent thing running through the forest. So, and I think underwater too. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's just incredible. And then um, I, I saw in, in that same chapter that you had talked about being on the set of the first avatar and seeing the, the real time effects technology that he was coming up with for that it, being used in its infancy. And I was just curious if you could elaborate on that at all. Cause that, that, I've seen clips of the behind the scenes and it just, it just seemed really interesting. And to see that when they were kind of figuring out the quirks of it must've been cool. When I showed up on the set, he was, there's a guy sitting on a, like a, a wooden horse, not a horse, but the kind you use for, for, uh, for construction, some kind of a, like a saddle thing uh, with dots all over him. And James had a, a camera that had little, that had no lens. It just had uh um, little balls on it, and he was wandering around. And I said, "What is all this?" And he took me into the room and showed me that when he was doing that, it was, there was a low-resolution model of the um, uh, the uh, Navi, and uh, but it, it looked real low-res and real like a bad video game. And then he showed me the uh, compl uh, the concept for the final, which was you know what you see in the movie. But I I just couldn't imagine it all coming together. It just looked too too wonky. And then when I saw the movie, I was blown away because he did a brilliant job pulling that all together. And he all had it in his head and uh, nobody else knew what he was doing until it was out. Yeah, that's one of the things that I love about James Cameron's work is that whether or not you like uh, uh, enjoy the content or, you know, or get swept into the story, you can't deny the fact that like, you go see something that he does. You just know that he's doing the absolute best way that it could possibly be done um and uh his, his actors sometimes pay for it but they all come back and work with him again which even says more about you know the, the quality of his work um speaking of quality of work we're going back to the blue lagoon you also got a thumbs up uh this is i saw this in your book um from spielberg uh when you showed him an early cut after finishing the sound mix um so, so oh, at this point you know, Spielberg, I'm assuming, is already a pretty established director. Um, like, what what was that like? And and was it really just that? Uh, you know, just a just a quiet thumbs up and nothing more. Well, I I I'd, I'd never done a five track mix. I'd only well, I guess I I did on on Greece, but 
uh, I was not the producer of that movie. On Blue Lagoon, I was the producer, and I really wanted the sound to work, and I had not personally supervised uh, this kind of a of a surround mix. I guess I guess maybe Grease didn't have all those tracks that we had on Blue Lagoon. Anyhow, uh, he had done a lot of that stuff, and so I thought, you know, he'd be the expert. And I just asked him to sit with me, listen to it, and uh, let me know what he thought. And he, yeah, he pretty much just said, "Great, that's about it." That was the only thing he said. And uh, I thanked him for his input. You also got a compliment from uh, John Waters, who said he loved it because everyone is young, rich, nude, and stupid. And, and that was uh, Summer Lovers. After that came out, he, at first I did Blue Lagoon and then Summer Lovers. And that's when he said that comment that everybody in my movies is young, rich, stupid, and naked. <laughs> do you, uh, do you, uh, uh, I mean, I, I'm sure, you know, which everything John Waters says, there's always uh, a degree of truth and a degree of humor. And where those two collide, that's what we get. Um, do you, it sounds if it was coming from anyone other than John Waters, that it, that it might be like a, a critique in a negative way, but I'm sure you under, you take it as a positive, but can you appreciate the sentiment where he's coming from with something like that? Well, um, I might actually, John did an art piece that I'm included in too, where he had four, um, f photographs in a row, five, maybe, uh, uh filmed the Robert Bresson and then, um, uh, all these different directors, European directors, and at the end, directed by Randall Kleiser, who is the direct, directing um, uh, credit, and at the end, it's had my name. And so the name of the piece was Reputation, meaning that here were all these arty guys, and here was me, kind of like the Hollywood hack. <laughs> and uh, I took it with a grain of salt, because I knew John was just joking around. That that I, I'm gonna kind of skip ahead a little bit because that that kind of comes up in your uh, book when you were talking about um, uh, the chapter with John Carpenter, uh, where you uh, you guys attended USC together and you two both uh, even at that time admired Hollywood narrative films. You aspired to make them, and there was a group of film students who were more so focused on the esoteric art films. Um, and they put you guys down for being quote unquote superficial and, and you even, uh, quip, which was, I thought was hilarious. I wonder where they're at today. Um, but I feel like there's a, there's a little, uh, a similarity there between, uh, John Waters sentiments and, um, and even going back to your days at USC where the criticism would come from. Uh, and I guess the question is, why do you think we all love these films because you see how much money they make and they go on to be pop culture and, and culturally significant in so many ways. Why, why do we as artists, and I'm, I'm guilty of this as well, because I, I, I love Wes Anderson and I'll shout it from the rooftops, but it, I'm not going to tell people that I went and saw the Barbie movie. Now also enjoyed that because I feel like it destroys some of my credibility as a filmmaker, or as a storyteller. And why do you think that is uh, that, that we, well, we well, all know we love these things. Well, um, pop culture, you know, it's there's a reason it's called pop culture because it's popular. And, and the reason it's popular is because it, it connects with people. And so a good story that, that's fun to watch and you laugh and, and you enjoy it is, uh, is certainly worth it. And then there's films that make you think. And, uh, you know, those, it's good to have a mixture of both, I think. You don't want to just have all of one. Yeah. Well, um, let's get in the 1982 Summer Lovers. You go from Blue Lagoon to this. And I thought it was just funny that you like you're given wardrobe departments very, very little to do in, in your uh, in these two films back to back. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, is it true that um, you were inspired to make the film after touring the uh, Greek islands on vacation? I saw that in the trivia. Yeah, when I went to uh, when I was doing the publicity for the Blue Lagoon, one of the journalists we were just chatting before the tape rolled and he said he just got back from Santorini. I said, what's that? He says, this Greek island where everyone runs around naked on the beaches. And I said, hmm, I see. <laughs> well, uh, would it be a great place to go for a vacation? He said, yeah. So right after the, I finished all the publicity for Blue Lagoon, I got on a plane and went over there and, and uh, with my camera and started looking around and thinking and came up with a plot, just watching what was going on there. And then I was back a year later shooting the movie. That's awesome. So did it did it live up to your um, 
Well, oh, did it live up to your expectations as far as the scenery great. location? It was great. I mean, it was like a, it's such a magical place, and and the the vibe there. I don't know. I think now it might have been taken over by tourism too much. But then when we shot the movie, it was mostly backpackers and and young people, and uh, they were all just um, meeting each other, making love. Uh, it was in the end of the '70s, before AIDS, and uh, things were really wild. And uh, Daryl Hannah is in that, and she has a line where she says, I used to dream I was a mermaid, which, uh, w and, and of course, she would go on to become a mermaid in Splash. And in your book, Drawn Directors, you, um, uh, you talk about a, sat a satirical reenactment that Ron Howard created uh, during the pandemic where he recalls his agent bringing Daryl Hannah to his attention for the lead in Splash after he saw her in Summer Lovers. Uh, and uh, uh, I thought it was humorous how he describes her and uh, very accurate, uh, the body of a goddess and the name of an accountant. Um, <laughs> I, ju I just thought that was very interesting. And I wonder, like, is that does that happen often in in Hollywood where directors are speaking to each other um, almost like casting? Oh yeah, yeah. Before the casting begins. Sure. I mean, wh whenever you work with an actor, it's always good to call a director who's worked with them before and just say, "Hey, is there anything to look out for?" Like John called me. Wh John Waters called me when he was going to work with Melanie Griffith, and um, and I uh, I told him that she was very easy to work with, except when I worked with her, she had three three teams three people one for hair one for makeup and one for wardrobe and at the end of every take she would these people would come in and adjust <laughs> her makeup her hair and her wardrobe so you know I had, I had to be careful about saying cut because everything would come in and just all that stuff and yeah but apparently I, I think she she had gotten over that uh, when he worked with her on uh, Cecil be demented I think it was yeah, yeah, she was fantastic in that too. Her and Stephen Dorff. That was, that is, if you're an independent filmmaker and you haven't seen that movie, I highly recommend it. It's such a fun flick, and it just it under it, it establishes very early on in the film that it understands the plight of the independent filmmaker and our just our weird passion that kind of excuses the behavior that sometimes wouldn't be excused in under other circumstances. Um, Nineteen eight. The score was done by Zoe Polidoris, the daughter of Basil Polidoris, who did a lot of my scores. And um, she's a wonderful composer. Oh, interesting. I, I love trivia like that, make th those connections that can be drawn. Um, in 1984, you did Grandview USA. And this is, again, from Drawn Directors, your book. When casting the lead in Grandview USA, Francis Ford Coppola uh, came over with his producer, Fred Ross, to pitch Matt Dillon from The Outsiders. Um, the story goes on, and it concludes with you guys talking on your deck over drinks, and Francis ends up on his butt, and uh, you went with Dillon, uh, Dillon's Outsiders co-star, C. Thomas Howell, instead of Dillon. Um, could you just elaborate a little bit on that, on that meeting? Because uh, we think of these... Um, these filmmakers, especially somebody like Francis Ford Coppola is somebody who's just like larger than life. And to imagine a situation like that, like I would have, I would have probably went with Matt Dillon just <laughs> because <laughs> just that under the circumstances. Well, um, at the time uh, I had uh, a deck in New York, I had a penthouse and it was outside and the design, the, the deck, the, um, the bench had been designed by my boyfriend uh, it was like this, and then it came in like that. So it's not, it wasn't, you know, it was a design, it was a design deck, a design bench, not a practical bench. So if you sat on one end of it, you could go like that. And that's where Francis sat and went off to the side. And I went, Ugh. you know, I felt so horrible that uh, he, he he fell on the, uh, because of the design of the, of the bench, not because of anything he did. So, but, you know, we went out to have some wonderful steaks, aged steaks around the block. And, and um, you know, it was fun. Fred Roos and he, the producer of The Godfather and Francis. But Thomas Howell was better for the part because um, he was more naive looking than, than um, Matt. You know, Matt was more uh, tough looking. Yeah, I think that na naivety to see that that Thomas Howe brings to his characters, I think it's like one of the only reasons why uh, with Soul Man, which has a, a great message at the end of the day, but the the route they take to get to that message, I don't think could have been accomplished with somebody that didn't have that 
persona that C. Thomas Howe brings to his characters. I, I definitely agree with that. I'm working with with uh, Jamie Lee Curtis was a lot of fun. She's so such a good actress and a lot of fun to work with. I'm so happy she got the Oscar this year. That was great. Yeah, what a shakeup with the Oscars this year. That was incredible. Like really good movies getting recognition for sure. Um, speaking of really good movies, finally at my my. What, easily my favorite live action Disney film, uh, 1987's Flight of the Navigator, which earned you a Best Director nod at the Academy of Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Horror Films. Um, how, how did you get involved with this project? Uh, let's see. Uh, it was a Disney project, so had I done something there? I, uh, it could be because uh, um, Jeff Katzenberg and Mike Eisner were running Disney, and I had done Grease for them at Paramount. I think they moved over there, and uh, to to Disney, and so they hired me to do this movie. And it was a co-production between Disney and uh, another thing, Mark um, Mark Damon's uh, producer sales organization. So there was two two companies. The, uh, Mark wanted to make an action picture. Disney wanted to make a family film. So they were pulling on the script. Mark, Mark wanted the spaceship to be shot down by the government and the, gov and the Disney wanted little, little uh, creatures in the strip. So I was in the middle trying to, trying to negotiate. And, and I think it actually helped because the movie has both elements. It has like kind of a dark action feel to it and then has the silly Disney kind of stuff too. So it's yeah. a, a weird blend of, uh, of, of styles. And they oddly don't work against each other, which it seems like only movies from the late 80s were able to accomplish this. Things like Never End in Story. Um, uh, actually, another example doesn't really come to mind off the top of my head, but films that were like a whole family could watch and they had those family friendly elements that you'd expect, but they were just grounded in this darker reality where you kind of felt real, the, the potential for real peril. And um yeah, I think you walked the line perfectly, especially knowing that you had two different uh, goals coming at you from the from the different production companies. The uh, the effects, uh, which were overseen by your brother Jeff, they were groundbreaking then. They still hold up today. They utilized the first instances of CGI five years before Terminator Two. Um, I watched like a, a hour and a half documentary on how the the ship had to be boated over to another place and assembled and things like this. And it was just so incredible. Well, um, the spaceship in Flight of the Navigator, we could not have done all of it with CGI because it was such a new field. So a lot of it was done with models. And there's a wonderful team that did a, m much of the work. And there's only like maybe 10% of it was actual CGI. But the, it was the ones where the ship would change shape. And when it would fly along, you could see things reflected on it. So those were the key moments that that my brother Jeff had worked on. But uh, Peter Donan was the super visual effects supervisor, and he put pulled people from everywhere to make that all happen. I remember that that the first reveal shot of the ship, the when it when it's shown levitating for the first time outside the hangar, the the lengths that were taken to create that illusion that it was actually floating in the air. I thought that was just so, just uh, I, I just really I think. I mean, that's why the movie holds up and it still holds up today is that it's just it's such a uh, it's such a groundbreaking and well-made film. There was, um, one, there was one scene that I really like when they coming out of the hangar, which I thought of on the way to the to the set. I started thinking about a way to use two mirrors and a middle model and a, and a thing. And, and and I was told no, that'll never work, it'll never work. And I said, let me just try it. And so we did it. It worked out great. It's the ship. It's the moment where the ship slides out of the hangar like that. And everyone's down below. And that was done all with mirrors. And I thought it was so much yeah. fun to try that's, that and have it work. <laughs> that's exact. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, that's exactly it. That's um, yeah, that's just, that's just really it's really it's just really cool. I, I, I read recently that um, that it's in the potentially you, know, you always hear things like this, but uh, that it might be being rebooted um oh. a former guest that we had on the show named brad copeland uh he he well, at least the last time i saw he was tasked with writing it and um uh i've heard that a lot there's been several scripts that have tried but i guess they just haven't gotten it so that it works but i am not asked to be part of that so it's, it's something that you know i'm not part of but that I happened mean, I, 
uh, somebody said it very i think it was actually uh john waters you know I, I was watching a recent uh interview he did on uh bill maher's podcast and he says something that was so profound to me i just i can't believe i haven't thought of it before but they were talking about reboots and remakes and he was like you know why do they why do they remake all the good ones just leave them alone remake the bad movies because they're the ones that need a second shot <laughs> that's a very good idea i, I agree so there, are, I, I just thought this was uh, clever in, in Flight of the Navigator. There were two nods to your previous works. Uh, you got the parents uh, listening to The One That I Want and uh, David asking when Starsky and Hutch comes on, which you, of course, directed three episodes of the television series. And is that, that that's I also I like to kind of create my own in-universe references. But I, I've done a few feature films and I know that, you know, it's different for you. But, but for me, you know, most people have not seen my work so i can't guarantee that the person that sees the next film i do also saw the last one either way i still like i still appreciate for some reason tying those things together and, and creating nods to other things that i've done just as a, a pat on my own back i guess sometimes and i was wondering like what's your mindset as far as like how do you work these things in what's your motivation for including those nods is it for the fans is it for your own legacy it's just for fun, but you know, anytime you see a, a movie marquee in a, in, a, in a film, you know, where people are passing by a movie marquee, who, whatever's on that marquee is something that the director thinks is cool, whether it's his own work or a, movie, a favorite movie or, or, or whatever, but they, you, you, ha you can be guaranteed that the director had something to do with what's on that marquee. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's uh, that that's yeah. I mean, we I guess because filmmakers at the end of the day are they start out. We all start out as people who just love film to begin with. So that makes sense. Mm -hmm. In 1988, we're in a uh, big top Pee Wee. Uh, this would pair you back up with Paul Rubens, who played Max uh, under the name Paul Maul in Flight of the Navigator, which he tricked me. I, I was sure that that was his voice when I saw Flight of the Navigator, but as a child, I saw Paul Maul in the credits, and I was like, oh, I guess it's just a really good impersonator, only to find out years ago with the internet and Google that that actually was him. Yeah. Uh, from, in your book, Drawn Directors, uh, you go into, in the Tim Burton chapter, who, of course, directed Pee-wee's first feature film, uh, Pee-wee's Big Adventure, uh, he attended uh, one of the zaniest parties that you ever threw, which had a, a mariachi band play in tequila, Paul Rubens riding a baby elephant shortly <laughs> after the, making Pee-wee's Big Adventure with Burton. And um, just kind of in your book, seeing all you guys, like like you putting all, everybody together in this story, it just made me wonder if, if you know, when you followed up uh, Burton's film with uh, in the Pee-wee universe, if you guys ever discussed before or after you know, your entries or compared them? Absolutely no. No, we did not. Um, uh, it was all, but but Paul was the producer of that movie. Uh, and uh, so I just wanted to make it, uh, do it the way he needed it done. And he, he, had, he did some wonderful things in that movie where he was kind of like doing stuff from the silent movies, you know, like stuff that Keaton would do. Like there's a moment where he's, uh, the, the the hurricane is pulling him and he's, he's horizontal and holding on. That's something right out of a, a, a Buster Keaton movie. And, um, you know, it was it was a blast. The party that we had, though, was was great. This baby elephant, which we ended up using in the movie, the, the trainer brought him to, to, to my house. And uh, the, the, he came through the house and out onto the patio where everybody, the party was going on. And then Paul rode it around the uh, pool while the band played tequila it was, it was i can only imagine crazy yeah it was a lot of fun and uh i i had seen an interview with paul rubin once it makes sense why he you know i why he go with uh uh tim um Tim Burton, uh, why he go with you? Uh, mm -hmm. In an interview, I saw with him talking about his films. How he had a like, it was his decision, or at least he was heavily. Uh, he had a lot of um, impact on who the director would be of his films, and he was talking about how that was like the most important thing to him that he wanted to have established, uh, serious directors that were that were you know well known for being able to craft a good story because he would take care of the comedy and the antics and the the looney tune stuff and but he wanted the film to be done well so i thought that was uh the the you just uh, con the average movie viewer watches a Pee Wee herman film and they don't pick up on the fact that you know, they just think it's a silly movie but they're actually really well made by 
by great directors like yourself. 1992, Honey, I Blew Up the Kid. This was a this is another film of yours that was nominated for a Saturn Award. And uh, again, drawing back from your book in the Francis Ford uh, Coppola chapter, you casually this is this is funny. You just kind of brushed past it that you were um, roommates with George Lucas at, at USC, which I just think is incredible. And uh, the fact that he shot your first project, that the student film you referred to uh, about your grandmother, and you also starred in his first live action short film. Um, and then uh, you were at the first screening of Star Wars and then fla fla flash forward some years, George Lucas and a few other classmates blindfolded you and took you to Disneyland for your 20th birthday. And to come back years later and see Star Wars attraction across from Honey, I Shrunk the, Shrunk the Audience, which you created, I could, I, you, you described it as surreal and I think that's perfect. But back in college, could you ever have imagined Oh God, no! I mean, we, George and I were both huge Disney fan, Disneyland fans, and Disney fans. But I used to have a map of Disneyland hanging over my bed when I was a kid, and so when I first went there in '58, I knew exactly where everything was, and I led my family around to different lands. But then, when George, uh, <clears throat> on my birthday so, so many years ago, uh, when he when he and his friends blindfolded me, I didn't know where we were going, and then took off the blindfold, and it was Disneyland. And, so uh, it is so weird now, years later, to have had that moment of seeing our two attractions across from each other. <laughs> yeah, they made it to the Mecca. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just think that's so incredible. And then also just to be a fly in the room uh, where a fly on the wall in the room where you know, on a random night where you and George Lucas are ordering pizza or trying to figure out what movie to watch is just like that that's a movie uh, that's a movie in itself i feel like there's got to be a story in there uh, well, George, my, third, Jordan Randall. My, third, my third book is about about the, the usc days uh with all my friends starting out and what it was like with john milius and george and caleb deschanel and matt robbins and walter merch that all the, this whole group that really took off uh, our whole class just uh, just got into the industry in a big way it was it was kind of very very unusual yeah, it kind of makes me wonder who are the teachers at that time because they, they were, were doing great. one hell of a job. They were wonderful. My yeah. favorite, my favorite teacher was Nina Fosh, who taught uh, uh, for forty years at USC and AFI, and she had studied with Uta Hagen and, and uh, Lee Strasberg and Stella Adler, and had been directed by Kubrick and Vince, Vincent Minnelli, and she put it all together in her own story, her own way of teaching, and. That's the, the show that we have on uh, Amazon, too, called the Nina Fosh Course for Filmmakers and Actors. And it's really, really good. It's for anybody who's interested in directing or acting. They, it's a four hours of, of teaching by the best teacher that USC ever had. That's awesome. Well, let's get into uh, Drawn Directors, Volume 1. This is available now on you can get it on Amazon. You can put it on the Kindle. Uh, you can get it on hardback, which I, I could imagine this would be a beautiful coffee table book. Um, Roger, I'm just going to let Roger Corman's words in the uh, foreword uh, explain what it is. I think he does it just perfectly well. It's a fascinating collection of candidly drawn sketches and anecdotes. And then just to add to that, uh, I just think it's a perfect book for movie fans because it's, of course, about movies and the people that make movies. But it's for me, like I, I, I love the idea of reading. I hate reading. Um, and when I got into your book, I didn't feel like I was reading. Uh, it's, it's illustrated for us dummies. Um, but there's, there, the, the stories are just so short and sweet enough that you're on to the next one before, you know, my brain is telling me, Hey, wait a second, you're reading a book, knock it off. And, and it's just very interesting. And, and the, the, the amount of, uh, directors uh, that you get into anecdotes about is just that the recognizable names is incredible um i would uh you know there well there's no way we're getting into all of them or even half of the ones that i'd like to but i did compile a few uh that i just wanted to elaborate on a little bit uh, maybe see where it goes um but first before we get into that what uh what sparked the idea for this and did you like were you always uh, like uh, a I don't want to say a doodler, but were you were you always sketching, and and where did that come from? Well, um, my my grandfather sent me to art school when I was a kid, and I discovered this technique called 
blind contour drawing. And what it is, you put your pen on the paper and then you move your eye and the pen at the same time and, and draw without looking down. And uh, a lot of times it comes out like a Picasso. The eye is here and the ear is there. And so it usually take, took me like about 20 times to for each drawing to get it to get it to resemble the director. But I was doing them all where they, they weren't what they didn't know I was doing it. I was like a Q and A's or I was in the front row doing all this. And um, so, you know, I, I, I really started out doing it in, in church because uh, my parents would take me to church and I'd be sitting there and a lot of times I was bored. <laughs> and so I started drawing the choir and I saw all these drawings of the choir from, from my childhood. And then when I would be around directors I, that I really admired, I wanted to, I started thinking, well, well, I just started doodling them and, and then I started doing a lot of them and I thought, well, let's make it into a book. <laughs> I think that's a, it's a, it's such a interest and and also props to you because you could take the names off of the pictures and at least ninety nine percent of them you know exactly uh, exactly what you're what who you're looking at. Um, I, I I'm pretty sure that I broke a few of the rules of uh, contour drawing, but I had the idea when when I found out we were doing this that while we were speaking, I would do my best contour drawing of you and, and return the favor. And it's it's hey, it, there you it's, go. It's not great, but it it is what it is. It's, it's real, right? It's, it's yeah. like a, it has like its own style. Yeah. Yeah, it really does create a, an interesting perspective. Um, <laughs> okay, so getting. Uh, Getting into the some of the chapters here, I wanted to start with Paul Thomas Anderson. Um, you talked about that. You say you you open it up perfectly with the with the greatest hook. Just he almost killed Daniel Day Lewis. Um, something uh, he says he says something you should never say to Daniel Day Lewis that looked fake. Um, and he he did say this to Daniel Day Lewis before Daniel Day Lewis threw himself down a fifty foot mine shaft in order to prevent something from looking fake. Yes. And uh, I just thought that was that was such a funny anecdote. And um, if you ever ran into something like that with an actor where uh, it, not that specifically, but with actors, there's always this fine line that you have to walk between, you know, getting the performance you need out of them without there. There's just there's there's so many personalities involved with with actors. And I was wondering how you navigate those situations. Well, I'm terrified of any kind of stunts because the idea of an actor getting hurt would make me crazy. And so, you know, um, I mean, I, I could never work with Tom Cruise on a Mission Impossible because look at what he does. You know? Yeah. It's like I'd just be like chewing my fingernails to the bone, you know. Uh, so I, I, don't, I, I, I try to avoid those kind of projects um, and just do, t you know, talking heads. It's much easier. Yeah. And with uh, with Paul Thomas Anderson's movie Magnolia, you were talking about in his chapter the uh, the frog scene, and you referred to it as bold. And I I was curious what you meant by by that. To to me, that that scene is the scene that tears people apart. Where they they if they love the movie or hate the movie, that scene is the reason that most people give for both feelings about the film. And I personally, I, I think bold is the perfect way to describe it. It's a it's a bold choice to tell a bold way to tell your story or to get a point across. And I was, I guess, I'm just curious how you interpreted that, what that scene meant to you. Well, I mean, it, it had some kind of parable uh, that he was getting through, but uh, just to actually physically show it, um, this surreal kind of magical realism moment. Uh, that's not any, like anything else in the movie. It, it, that's what I meant by bold. I mean, usually if you're going to set up a style like that, you set it up and you do it a few times, but he just did it in that one section. So mm -hmm. that, 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 you know, it just breaks all the rules, and that's why I thought it was bold. Yeah, it bends the genre. You're in a drama for 99% in the film, and then all of a sudden you're kind of in a fantasy. Right. Yeah. Um, in the uh, Tim Burton chapter, uh, you said – you were talking about uh, your favorite film of his, or one of your favorite films of his, Ed Wood. Uh, and you said when, when shooting Bride of the Monster, he faces the quick question that all directors have to deal with when something goes wrong during a take. Should I reshoot or can I find a way to rationalize and move on? And I, I, I just, I literally screamed like, yes, yes, <laughs> this resonates. This is so affirming to hear is, I think is that, I, 
yes, Mongo would have those problems banging into the wall, you know, and so the, why don't we move on to the next shot setup? You know, that, was, that made me laugh out loud. That was so funny. It was just very comforting to hear that, you know, because you know, a lot of the times when like for myself personally, I'm, I'm making a movie that's under a $10,000 budget and I have these, I go through these emotions and these feelings and, um, a lot of the times you can just chalk it up to I'm alone in feeling this or only people at my level are experienced in wow. these kinds of things. But then to find out that, you know, these these at least the inner troubles or the, the way we questions our question ourselves on the inside goes all the way up to uh, to for someone like yourself. Uh, with your career to even acknowledge a uh, sentiment like that was very assuring to hear. And have you like on Greece or flight of the navigator or, or blue lagoon, was there ever, you know, did, can you think of an example where you had to, had to go through those rationalizations? Oh, on every single one. Sure. I mean, because there's always something, some challenge like the light is going or the, you're going into overtime and you have to compromise and uh, all the, the wonderful sequence that you had in mind, you have to instantly figure out another way to do it. And I think that that my my experience directing episodic television uh, really, really trained me for anything that goes wrong. Because once you once you work in that field where you have to shoot out ten pages a day and make them have them make sense, that you can always take any sequence and go back to that type of shooting if you have to. And you don't want to, but sometimes you have to. And so that training was good because I, I know how to how to simplify really quick in an emergency. Yeah, that, that makes sense to so direct in TV, getting you ready for that. Uh, we talked to somebody, uh, Lisa Gorlitsky, who worked in soap operas, uh, soap operas, and she had mentioned something similar, you know, when you're that uh working in that kind of environment where it's like, you got to go, go, go. We got to get the next one, whether we got the last one or not, we're on a schedule. And um, to, to be able to think quick on your feet and improvise and rationalize to, to bridge the gaps in those areas and make it to the next scene. Um, we kind of got into John Carpenter already, but uh, he, uh, he said something, or you quoted him as saying something in your book that I thought was really, uh, interesting. Um, I was surprised to read that he never watches his movies because he doesn't want to chastise himself. And that stood out to me because, in my uh, I, I've made a few films and my biggest lessons have always been learned out of the shame that I feel when I go back and watch something after a few years and I can look at it more critically. Um, and that's you know, when I I'm going to do that differently next time. I'm not going to make that mistake again. Uh, do you watch your previous films and how, how do you feel about? Uh, well, sometimes people ask for a clip from a, an old film of mine. And uh, there's one film that I did that I I looked at looking for a clip and I couldn't find one. <laughs> I couldn't find a single clip that I would want to show. And that yeah. was a movie called Dawn Portrait of a Teenage Runaway. And you know, I just I just couldn't find a clip, you know, I, unfortunately. It's so yeah, I, I, sometimes I look back and I just cringe a little bit. But hopefully, you know, there's other ones where I really, really feel proud. Like my I did a movie called Getting It Right that most people have not seen, but I it's probably my favorite, one of my favorite films, and it's um, done in, it's shot in England with um, Helena Bonham Carter and Lynn Redgrave and Sir John Gielgud, and it was so much fun because it was uh, an homage to the '60s comedies coming out of Britain that I saw in film school, and this plot was very similar to that, a misfit in London, and um, I got to do that with a lot of the people from those movies, so. That one is very dear to my heart, and I love that movie, and I'd show that to anybody. That's really cool. Yeah, and it's it's weird. Sometimes the things that we the the project that we dislike the most of our own is is seems to be the fan favorite that we wish we didn't have to hear about again. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've heard that more time more more than a handful of times where the filmmaker's favorite project is more often than not the least appreciated of their work. Um, so it's called Getting It Right. And that, you're, you were uh, friends with uh, Helena Baum and Carter, right? Yes, for, because of that movie, yeah. I mean, we, okay. she, I, I really didn't think she could do it because I'd seen her in, in Room with a View that had just come out when we did that back in 88 or something. And uh, she, wanted to, she wanted to prove that she could be an anorexic 
uh, punk, which is what the part, the part was op the opposite of this very sophisticated woman she played in the Room of the View. And I said, I don't think so. So she came in to uh, audition, really, uh, not not to read the part, but she came in with her hair all messy and kind of lousy clothes. And I, oh, well, maybe that'll work. And it did. It, it, she was great at it. She's a terrific actress. She doesn't get nearly enough credit for her ability to take these dark characters and like underscore them with this this perfectly subtle humor that you could laugh out loud at while she's being diabolical in the same scene. It's, she's yeah, she's really good. Um, the uh, the Coen Brothers. These are they're one of my of course uh, I'm an independent filmmaker. The Coen Brothers, it, no yeah. surprise, are one of my favorite uh, sets of filmmakers. Um, they were also uh, USC classmates, and uh, uh, it, it, uh, I'm I sorry. Think, I don't think they went to USC. I don't think so. Oh okay. Oh no, that's right. It wasn't them. It was your USC classmate that inspired the character of Walter Sobchak oh, yes. in The Big Lebowski. Yeah. Could you elaborate on that? Like, and do you do you can you speak on any ways specifically that um, Walter was inspired by? Well, what, sure. he... I mean, John Milius um, was a, a amazing raconteur at even back in, at USC, and when he would start a story, everybody would sort of gather and. He, he just was amazing about his stories and, and bigger than life. He he created a persona. Uh, he would sometimes come in a big uh, Mexican cowboy hat and he had guns and he, he, he was kind of like uh, making himself into a legend in his own mind. <laughs> and we all loved him and he was so much fun. Um, and so the Coen brothers uh, made him into uh, the what's the name of the character? Um, the, the big oh, old, Wal Walter Sobchak. Yeah, the big old yeah. made by John uh, Goodman, right? Yeah, fantastically. Yeah, and that yeah was, one of my one of my uh, favorite characters in the movie. That was John. The, 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 so the big personality, very abrasive. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, Wes Craven is another. Of course, I, yeah, I told you I, I grew up watching Nightmare on Elm Street, arguably long before I, sh I should have been allowed to. Uh, yeah. But uh, I was I was surprised also in your book to find out that. Um, well, I'll just I'll just spoil it. It is so fascinating to me to find out that the house that blows up in Scream 3 is a replica of this of, of, the, of the house that belongs to the guy that directed Grease. That <laughs> is uh, like I said, I love these little connections that happen in yeah. Hollywood. And that that right there is just such a a, fan, a fascinating tidbit of information. And I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on how that, uh, like, are, are you and Wes Craven, were, were you guys close to the degree no, that he come and asked we, that? We knew each other, but we weren't close. But um, he, uh, he, he lived near me. And so when he was looking for a, a place to do Scream 3 to set the, the scene, he he... he approached me about that and then he was in the house shooting for quite a while and then they built a replica in the way on the valley in a big parking lot they built a gigantic replica it was about a third scale which is quite big and they had five cameras and they uh exploded the house with five cameras rolling and uh it looked great and they used it in the movie I feel like you could have got one over on your um your insurance company with that with the footage from that maybe collected on something for a house you still had. <laughs> yeah, that's a great idea. No, I didn't think of that. <laughs> um, in your uh, chapter about Cameron Crowe, you got you dive into a little bit about uh, the the production of Vanilla Sky and shutting down Times Square for that open end sequence. And um, we uh, uh, have David McGifford on the, on the show quite often, uh, who was the first AD on that. And he has a book that's, uh, it would be a nice cousin uh, to your drawn directors because it's also a book full of anecdotes about uh, filmmaking and films through the years and the filmmakers. Um, but he, he, he had kind of elaborated on the logistics of, shutting down Times Square and, and essentially having to to quarrel with the uh, with the locals that are trying to get to work and trying to go about their day and having to give out free donuts and stuff like that. And um, I get the, the, the segue here is like, what is the most that right there is kind of like the epitome of of the, the craziest thing you have to do to accomplish a shot. And uh, in the films that you've made, is, is there was there anything that was like so logistically challenging that you thought the night before there's no way to accomplish this? Well, the, it reminds me, that story reminds me of uh, when we were shooting Getting It Right, we had um, a scene with the, uh, 
the famous bridge in London, not the London Bridge. People think it's the London Bridge. It's the one with the towers. I don't know what they call that bridge. Tower Bridge? I don't know. The most iconic London Bridge. And we needed to shoot at it. And we didn't have the money. It was a low-budget movie to get the cops to close it down. So our production assistants um, got in the car, and they, when they got to one end of the bridge, they jumped out and started having a fight so that all the, all the traffic stopped, <laughs> and then we could film on the bridge. <laughs> that's how we did the low budget version of, of what they did in Times Square. That is that's awesome. Stage a real life thing. I, I did something, uh, um, and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, two the, my second to last film, uh, called I'm gonna kill someone this Friday. Uh, we we very low budget, we didn't have the money to pay for permits, and uh, we had to shoot a scene at a uh, public park where um, a murder takes place. Uh, 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 somebody gets sledgehammered in the middle of a public park. Wow. And we knew that there was no way to go about this uh, logistic. Like the, there was no way we we're going to do this like guerrilla style and get away with it because it, we're risking the actor getting shot by, you know, a drive, a, a police officer driving by not realizing that this is, you know, fake. So we had to, we had to figure out a way to put it on the books somehow so that the city knew what we were doing, but we didn't have the the means to pay for it. And we, you know, so long story short, too late for that. But the reason that the way we got around it was uh, some people from the cast were, uh, uh, they were scheduled to get married and uh, we asked them to move their wedding date up and you could reserve that park for an hour or so for a wedding at no cost. And, uh, we specified in the notes for the wedding that there was going to be a uh, a violent performance that was a part of the ceremony, and mm-hmm. and that's how we got around that. I just I thought that was pretty. So there's it's just a, a you know there's always a way around if you're uh, imaginative and creative enough. Work around. That's what they say. How you get get away with something? Okay. Yeah. Um, Going into uh, David Fincher's chapter of your book, uh, you said something, you brought something up in that chapter that is going to haunt me now until the day I die. And wow. you you said, uh, I wonder if David shot an insert of what was in the box. Yeah. And now my morbid brain cannot get that out of my head of like wondering if that is the case. Mm-hmm. Um I just wanted to throw that out there, but in the David Fincher chapter, you do go into something that was really fascinating to me that I would love for you to elaborate on. You talked about following the 9-11 attacks. You, David Fincher, and Spike Jones uh, worked together, tasked by the CIA to come up with possible future scenarios the terrorists might try. That's like a movie. It feels like a movie like The Men Who Stare at Goats. Uh, like a, a movie like that needs to come out of this story. But could you share, like, uh, like how do you... How do you guys come up with like with something like that? Like, well, like we're... we were we 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 uh, we tried to think of what what else would be a, a, a way for them to attack America, and one of the one of them was to set the whole Hollywood sign on fire, and another one was to attack the Oscars. So we were we came up with ideas about that, and luckily none of that happened. But they did. That year of the Oscars, when we came up with that thought, they did have snipers everywhere around the Oscars. So I guess they took our, our suggestion seriously. Just everybody at the Oscars. Thanks a lot, Kleiser. Appreciate it, <laughs> Fincher. <laughs> I got that padded down. Yeah, that's uh, that that's just so fascinating to me. I, you hear about that all the time, like the CIA kind of working with Hollywood because you know it, you just hear about it, and it's a to see to be speaking to somebody who actually was on the other side of something like that uh an operation like that is just it's, it was well, very well, interesting well, very hush hush at the time but somehow the word got out and so you know uh, we were trying to keep it quiet the word will always get out <laughs> um christopher nolan uh the, the chapter on Christopher Nolan, you go into how he tries to rely as much as possible on practical in-camera effects over computer-generated graphics. Um, and I recently read that zero CGI was used in Oppenheimer. Uh, so that that ring is true. But on the, on the uh, subject of Oppenheimer, in that chapter, you go into uh, that, that Christopher Nolan's film, um, or that Christopher Nolan's film, let me let me rephrase this. 
I'm seeing that on Saturday. I can't wait to see um, that, that he didn't use CGI. I can't imagine how he did that. Yeah, just by the trailer, the explosions in it are, uh, yeah, it's just, it's incredible. Uh, oh, that okay, that's, that's where I was trying to go with that thought. Christopher Nolan's film would not exist without Oppenheimer, and neither would you. Um, could you elaborate on that, or what that means? Well, yeah, you see, my dad was at D-Day, and he was, uh, uh, he came back from D-Day, and uh, into Lebanon, Pennsylvania, where he grew up. And he was about to be uh, sent out to the Pacific to fight against uh, the Japanese um, in, in World War II, you know. And then they dropped the bomb and the world war was over. And so he got to stay in his hometown and marry my mom. And that's where I came from. So if, if the bomb had not dropped, he would have gone over there and I wouldn't be here. Such a such a small world again. More, more little connections. Um, the last uh, the last chapter I wanted to touch base on was the one on Ridley Scott. You say you want to be like Sir Ridley Scott when you grow up, uh, which is a funny sentiment sentiment in itself. But what do you, what do you mean by that? He's just such a great craftsman and a, a, a wonderful, sensitive director as well. I mean, what 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 really um, impressed me the most about him was when he was doing the movie about, um, oh God, what was the name of that movie? Uh, about um, Getty, the movie about Getty. I forget the name of it, but Kevin Spacey was the star of it. And I think it was six weeks before the movie was to be released, the whole scandal about Kevin came out and what were they gonna do? Release the movie? No, Ridley said, we'll recast it. And he went and got, um, Christopher Plummer and went and reshot all the shots that included um, that character and seamlessly put them into the movie six weeks before the uh, release. And and he, since he knew what all the setups were and knew the lighting and everything, he, he did it like bam, 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 like that. It came out and you couldn't tell there was anything that happened on that movie. It was just totally slick and perfect. And uh, I went, wow, how could he have done that, you know? And uh, just to have that skill. And he's he's getting up there, and I'm getting up there now, too. <laughs> and um, what I mean about I want to be like him is to be able to direct. He's, he directed two big movies in one year and, at, at that age. And so, you know, to be able to, to, to just have the stamina and the uh, ability mentally to do all that is pretty impressive. Yeah, make it a movie is a strenuous operation. It's a very condensed and consolidated. It's like a year's worth of work condensed into two to three weeks or months. And <laughs> the, the toll it takes, it's almost like when a, when somebody becomes president, they age like 15 years and four years. The same kind of thing happens to filmmakers. You just watch the directors age two years for every project they do. Um, well, the... Uh, the the book is available on Amazon again. You can get it wherever books are sold. And uh, the, beyond what we talked about, there's also chapters about Danny Boyle, James L. Brooks, George Clooney, Guillermo del Toro, John Favre, Francis Ford Coppola, Adam McKay, Jordan Peele, Robert Redford, Rob Reiner, Jay Roach, John Singleton, Stephen Sotober, Barry Sonnenfeld. Penelope Spiris, Sylvester Stallone, Taika Waititi, John Waters, and Robert Zemeckis, and that's just scratching the surface, if you can believe yeah. it. And that is and that is volume one. I have volume two <laughs> after this that has another one hundred directors in it. That's awesome. Do you have a do you have plans or, or a, for when you um, we're going to have volume two ready? Um, it's kind of ready, but I, I want to see how volume one does first about how fast to get it, the second one out. But this. Yeah. The first one has 120 directors in it, so it's taken years to do this, but um, it's been great because I, I love these people. I love these. I admire so many of these directors and uh, and and their skill and their, their personalities and their work. It's just great. I feel like you're gonna have directors approaching you now, like, "Hey, man, where was my? Uh, how come I wasn't in it?" I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, at the close of things, I usually ask what advice filmmakers have for other filmmakers, but I think your book actually offers some of the best advice through the words of other filmmakers whose sentiments you echo. Um, there's four of them. Spike Lee says, uh, love what you do. Don't be lazy. Perfect your craft. Express yourself. Make a way. Believe in your work. Follow your passion. Write and defend your work. And I think, I mean, 
today more so than ever the, those words are are just so relevant um you know being able to stand by what you say and defend it it's not to say that everything that is said should be said but um in that creative realm i just think that's that's interesting that you should be able to ex, you know experiment a little bit and and stand by those things um sam mendez uh he actually his American beauty is the reason that I wanted to start making movies. Mm -hmm. um, his, his uh, advice in your book is try to make the familiar strange and the strange familiar. There's no right and wrong. There's only interesting and less, less, less interesting. That really resonated with me because I, I think that's the entertainment and what entertains you is such a subjective experience that it's so what is right or wrong. You see some people love something that other people hate and it, that's yeah. just yeah. Uh, I did a four-hour interview with Sam Mendez that's on the Directors Guild website under Visual Histories. Uh, oh, I, I interviewed him for four hours. It's it's wonderful. It's uh, DGA.org. Yeah, yeah. I'll definitely I'll check that out. I'll put a link to it in the description of this video as well. I'm also gonna put a link to wherever people can purchase uh, drawn directors as well in the description. Um, uh, Robert Rodriguez also has some advice in your book, and he is probably his book uh, "Rebel Without a Crew" is probably responsible for a majority of the independent filmmakers of my generation. He says something that also really resonated with me. He said, "Take stock in what's around you and make a movie around that." Um, the film I was telling you about, "I'm Going to Kill Someone This Friday," the the murder scene that takes place in a park at the end. That park boasts a tree called Treaty Oak. It's one of the biggest trees. Uh, I don't want to speak out of turn here. It's a huge, beautiful tree that exists in Jacksonville and only Jacksonville. And when I started to write that movie, that that advice, you know, echoing what Robert Rodriguez said, I always start with, all right, what are the resources that I have at my disposal right now? How can I work them into a story that's interesting? Or how can I tell a story with what I have? So I, I thought that was, it's truly coming from an independent filmmaker with a sentiment like that. You know, you don't have, you don't have a lot, but you have what you have and you can make something with it. And then the uh, the last piece of advice in your book was Martin Scorsese. Uh, he said, who I, I was shocked to find out, taught Spike Lee and Oliver Stone at NYU. Um, he said, if you don't get physically ill seeing your first rough cut, then something's wrong. <laughs> and uh, th have you ever felt that way? Like watch it. I know you say you went back and watched the film and you couldn't find a, a good clip from it, but upon watching the first cut of a film, were you ever like, it never works. It never works. It's, it's because <laughs> all your dreams are not there yet. But um, the, the advice that I also add to all of that, to uh, whenever I talk to students or filmmakers is to write something that is painful to reveal something that's in your, in your emotion, you know, it makes you feel uncomfortable and you don't want to, to, to get it out there. And those are the ones that seem to work really well because other people will identify mostly with that. And that's how I felt about my movie. It's my party, which was about an uh, assisted suicide during an AIDS crisis. So, you know, that's something that's, that touches you. So my, the Peach, my master's thesis was about my grandmother dying. So, you know, find something that's hard to talk about and, and make a movie about that. That that seems so true because it's you hear that a lot with actors. Like the the best actors are able to take themselves to this place of vulnerability, um, and it, that seems like it's along the same sentiment. Whereas a writer, a director, is a storyteller. That if you if you uh, make if you make yourself address painful things and it's going to force you into that vulnerable place where people can identify with what you're saying a little easier yeah. that's that's great advice all right with that we'll get into the part in words here just in time um do you have anything coming out that you'd like to let on audi audiences know about yeah i have a documentary that should be coming out soon called baby boomer yearbook and it was inspired by michael apted's uh seven up series uh, where he took uh uh, he interviewed people every seven years in England. And what I did was I took my high school class and I, um, I was the editor of the yearbook. And so I took them every 10 years in the position of their yearbook photo and interviewed them. And this, this is uh, the, the result is this one hour special baby boomer yearbook. We're right now taking it around, trying to find a home for it. And it should, it may be out, end up on PBS or something. I'm not sure where we're going to show it, but it's for baby boomers. 
That's that's really cool. That's a that's a fantastic idea. Actually, uh, I, 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 we've shown it around, and some young people like it too. So that's unusual. Yeah, I, I can imagine. I mean, if uh, if they're ahead of their time, and I mean, there's there's always young people that appreciate stuff that are you know that appreciate a good story. As long as there's a good story there, it doesn't matter who's telling it. <laughs> um, before we say goodbye, are there any parting words that you'd like to leave the audience with? Well, um, let's see. Uh, Grease is the word. No. <laughs> I, I mean, I can't believe that that movie is still kicking. I we, I just was in San Antonio this last weekend with the, with the T Birds and the Pink Ladies signing autographs, and it was amazing. There's there's a woman who came up who had her whole body was tattooed with images from Greece. And there was uh, people brought babies with little pink wigs on them, and I mean it's like Looney Tunes. But uh, and the most my most fun part is the Hollywood Bowl when we, because when I was in, when I was in college we used to go to um, Rocky Horror Picture Show at midnight, and to be in the stage of the Hollywood Bowl and see seventeen thousand people dressed up in the costumes from Greece and singing the songs is another surreal uh, experience. I can only imagine. Yeah, that's got to be incredible and well deserved. I mean, it's uh, my my. It was my mom's favorite movie. I grew up watching it. She always every time she cleaned, she had it on. If it wasn't Dirty Dancing, it was Grease. Were the two movies that she would rotate in the VCR, and, uh, and I think that's why it lives on is because it has it captures you, and then it's it's you know you could show it to your kids you could show it to, you could show it to anybody and i think people do and then those kids grow up and show it to their kids and i don't think a movie like that will and it was a period piece even when it was made now it's a period piece of a period piece which is even more interesting so i just i think no matter what i do from now on it'll always be on my tombstone <laughs> That's uh, well, with that, I want to say one more time, remind you guys to go grab uh, Drawn Directors Volume One right now available on Amazon. And the link will also be in the description of this video. Uh, Randall, Mr. Kleiser, uh, the legend, God himself, <laughs> I, I sincerely you. appreciate you taking the time to do this. And on your birthday again, happy birthday. Your research was impeccable and you're a good interviewer. So thank you. Thank you very much. Have a great one. Enjoy the rest of your birthday. Bye-bye.